Come here to use a full professional recording studio and make their own multi track demo tapes or records. Um, yeah, go on. Okay. We are love! This could be funky fresh in the flesh. Tomb seeds, small seeds, be chased up mess. Now we rock and we roll, and we go for gold. From a very young age, that's what we were told. Don't be weird and prepare as we rock the beat, because we're kicking it. Love. deck, drum machine and microphones are all connected to this. It's the mixing console. But that's all right, because you don't need hype when rocking a mic. Well, I'm taller than him, darker in In all, 24 separate sounds can be connected, and each one individually adjusted before recording. This is the heart of the recording studio. This is a 24-track tech recorder, and it's beautiful. Now, it's just like any other tape recorder, even your personal stereo at home. The only difference being is it's a great deal bigger. Now, the reason it's bigger is it's got a very much more complicated job to do than, say, your uh, Walkman or your personal stereo. Because your personal stereo only has two channels, right and left. This has got 24 channels. Have a look at the heads. Now, if you have a look at the recording head on your personal stereo, you see, there's only two shiny bits for the left and right channels. But this head here, as you can see, has got 24 shiny bits for the 24 tracks. So you can put each track separately on the tape. Now, speaking of the tape, let's have a look at it. It's two inches wide, and if I put this gadget on it, you can see the magnetic pattern which has been put on it. And it's put there by the recording head using the electrical impulses from the microphones and the instruments. Now, the 24-track tape recorder is wonderful, but you don't actually need it to make good home recordings. All you really need are two cassette recorders, and you do what's called bouncing the sound from one cassette recorder to the other, and adding extra instruments along the way, and that way you build sound up. It's a great thing to do. But if you're lucky, you might be able to beg, buy, or borrow one of these. This is a complete four-track studio. It's got the mixer, it's got meters, it's got all these things for sort of building your tracks and so forth. But it doesn't use wide two-inch tape. It just uses a cassette like you can buy in the shops anywhere. I can tell you, these are smashing. And in fact, nowadays, they've even got mini versions of these, which probably are about as big as this corner of the machine, about the size of a large video cassette. And I can tell you, they're really good. How is it that we know that this is the sound of a guitar? Whereas this one is the sound of a trombone. And the man with all the answers is John Jones from Air Studios. Both of those notes came from one machine, this computer, didn't they? How does it work? Well, it records uh, like a tape machine, except it records into a computer instead of onto tape. And uh, it converts the sound into numbers. And then we can get all different sounds from the same machine. Play it back at different pitch. Now, can it record anything? Yes. How yeah. about me? Yes, it can record you <laughs> quite easily. OK. Uh, all we do is plug a microphone in, go to our sampling page. If you say a sentence, I'll start recording. And ready? This is Science in Action reporting from Air Studios in London. We wait a second, we see what we've got. This should be it. Here it comes. This is what it sounds like. This is Science in Action reporting from Air Studios in London. And is each of those ups and downs, that's one word or part of a word, is it? 
each section in time would be different part of the different words that you said. So if I move the start point, say to there, and we would get action reporting from S to action reporting from action reporting from or near the end I could get the word Videos London. Videos in London. Videos in London. Is in London. But you don't use word sampling all the time on this machine, do you? I mean, you sample other things. Uh, not too often. It might be used for an effect, uh, say, like a Max Headroom. This, 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 this is know, science in action. This, 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 this. This, 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 this is science in action. This is science in action. Mate, very, very clever. For humour. Right, well, let's have a look at the shape of the trombone that we had earlier, shall we? And here's the trombone. Up and down is the volume of it, the amplitude. This is the duration. If you look at the front of the note there, that's very different, isn't it, from the rest of it? Yes, that would be the attack. That's what helps us to differentiate between sounds. And you can see how it's loud and then quiet and then tailoring right off. And that's what we're hearing, that brah at the beginning, is that shape. Yeah, and that's what really makes it sound like a trombone, is it? Yes. So, let's see how much difference the attack does make to the sound of an instrument. We've recorded three instruments, but we've taken the attack off the front. See if you can tell what they are. Right, and now with the attack put back on. Well, that's really great if you've got £70,000 to spare. But you can try experimenting with the attack on the front of the note yourself. What you need is a cassette recorder like this, record a note on it, and then rewind it and stop the recorder just before the note starts. Then, if you take out the cassette, you can actually pull out the tape and cut off just a little bit of it using one of these special editing blocks. It's the sort of thing you can get in your local hi-fi shop. Now you'll have to experiment. It'll only be a very small amount you have to take off. But then when you put it back together again, do use this special editing tape, otherwise you'll just graunch up the works. Now you can, though, experiment with sampling with one of the cheaper machines. John, you know all about that, don't you? Yes, I have one right here. And this one's actually under 100 pounds. And uh, it does the same thing the Fairlight does, obviously a lot, it's a lot cheaper. And I'll give you an example, just put it in record. There's a mic over here, all I do is push the sampling button and... Uh, now, I can play it back. Now I can play chords. Back in the 1960s, making electronic music was quite a business. You needed racks and racks of electronics and very expensive computer gear to make even the simplest of sounds. It's a sad fact. Those wonderful old machines they were great in the time, but they've been outdated by things like this. This synthesizer has got hundreds of sounds it can make just at the touch of a button. There's one, here's, here's another. Jolly nicer sound as well. But if you want to make your own sounds, it's as well to know a bit about the physics involved. And to tell us a bit is Chris Jordan. Now, Chris, you've made a synthesizer that works in conjunction with the BBC Micro. So can you, first of all, tell us a bit about the basics we ought to know? Well, one of the most important things about sound on a computer is the waveform. And uh, using the waveform name I've got on the screen at the moment, I can actually play you an example of a simple one. This one is called Pure. Now, that's a pure waveform. Yeah, and it sounds pure. It's clean, and we can see it's nice, rounded shapes on the oscilloscope. Have you got another one? 
Well, I can select another one off this list. This one's called Reedy. In fact, it's a pulse wave. Again, we can see on your telescope that's that squared off and that. This one's a ramp wave, which again has got sharp edges to it. Right. Yeah. And again, that sounds different, so it's not just the appearance on the oscilloscope that's important, it's also what we hear in the ears. OK, now, if I play a higher note, you can see there are more waves on the screen because it's got a higher frequency. And lower notes have a lower frequency, so you get less waves. By the way, if I change the volume, watch the amplitude. So if you're going to go for a more complicated waveform, what would that look like? Here's one called watery, which has a number of different sounds added together to make a more complicated one. Oh, yeah, it's quite nice, then. Got another one. This one's called pipes. Again, it's got sounds added together, quite a few of them in this case. So for something like the sound you get out depends on what you put into it, like making the case. Indeed. Now, you've got a piano sound put into that computer. Can you wire that up for me? That's right. Here's the upright piano sound. Right, give it a go. Gosh, that's really nice. That's brilliant now. So listen, if you're going to synthesize a piano, how'd you go about it? Well, the first thing to think about is what the piano actually does to make its particular sound. If I have a look at the way a piano works, I can see that we have a hammer that hits the string in order to make the sound. And we also have two strings, at least, for most of the keys on the piano. If I change that envelope to one called strike, we'll get a much more hammer-like attack to the note. Oh, yeah. The envelope means that you've changed the attack, you know. That's right. It, it's subtle, but you can actually get the feeling that something's actually been hit there. Yes, yeah, good. We've now got the effect of the hammer hitting the string. Yeah. Now, the other thing is the second string. If I actually bring in the sound of the second string on this keyboard, we'll hear a much more realistic piano sound. Oh, yeah. Well, that's great, is that? That's got much more... Full of three-dimensional effect. That would really pass for a good piano, that, I like that. What happens if you move the strings further apart? Detune it, as we say. Well, we get the effect of an out-of-tune piano, or, in particular, a honky-tonk piano. That's my kind of piano. <laughs> <laughs> oh, marvellous. That's been sitting in my granny's basement for three years. That's the sound I like. Yeah, great. And that's what happens with a real piano, is that if you have two strings and one goes out-of-tune, you get that same effect. That's right. So the synthesis is very close to the real action. Uh, now, we, we messed about with the waveforms and the strings and so forth. What happens if we take the tack away completely, the, the front of the note? Right, I can do that by choosing another envelope off this list. In this case, one called soft. Listen. Oh, yeah, that's very mellow. It's like an organ, though, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Not? We can make it even more like an organ by changing the waveform to this one called pipes which we heard earlier and actually gives a much more complicated tone. So this is one of the original sound. waveforms you... Oh, get in! Well, that's not that's just come out of this machine. It's fantastic. And you can make a set of sounds just using the BBC micro on its own, can't you, Chris? That's right. The programme I have here is called Preset Synthesizer, and like the modern synthesizer you saw earlier, actually has various sounds recalled by the keys of the keyboard. This is a plain sound. Right, John, have you got another one? This one's called Phasing. That's quite nice, is that? What I like about that is that you don't need a black-and-white piano-type keyboard, you can actually do it all on the computer keyboard itself. That's right. Any more sounds? This is an interesting one called the Inharmonic Combination. And that's all done just using the BBC Micro. Tell you what, though, can you put your synthesizer back in and show us the 8-track mixing desk? Yes, I've got the mixing desk on the screen of the computer now, and you can see that there are volume controls, faders, in fact, that influence the volume of each of the sounds playing, and pan pots that allow you to move the sound from one side to the other in the stereo field. Right. And eight of those sounds can play simultaneously and be controlled from the desk. I can play the piece from the top by pressing just one key. Here it is. <laughs> Sampling keyboards, digital synths and microelectronics have all brought a veritable orchestra to your fingertips. Steve Martin is a keen amateur musician trying to break into the professional world. 
But it's one thing making up your own tunes and quite another writing for somebody else. The rhythm is set because of the pulsing action of the light. You know, look, if you've got the handle here, yeah. you're going one, boom, boom, you know, all the time while... Doug Lear runs a magic lantern show, using equipment and slides from the Victorian times. I remember they're dissolving as well, they're continuous movement. Mm -hmm. So the sound needs to be uh, sort of flowing through all the time. It's got to have rhythm. I mean, He wants like a piece of music to go with a special sequence of slides. Finding out what the pictures are and how the client wants the music to work with them is the most important and difficult thing that Steve has to do. Side with the pattern and the other side, one's clockwise and the other's anti-clockwise, isn't it? So that you have a vortex and that means that your eye is pulling and pulsing to that rhythm. So the music somehow has got to give a movement, it's got to swell because, you know, we're bringing the light up and down. You get the idea. Mm -hmm. Back in the studio, the creative work starts. First, a rhythm track. The drums are digital recordings of real drums. And this is a digital recording of a real voice. Add a bass track. And after some adjustment, a line of melody. Steve gradually builds up the piece of music, playing each part onto a multi-track tape recorder. And then eight tracks later, this is the result. Thank you. 